It is good to be back. Um, while, I away, while I was away, some things happened. Twink turned 101. Twink, happy 101st birthday, a little belatedly. I also want to thank um, Reverend Samuelson and Reverend Bill Nairote, who preached and led worship these past three Sundays. I want to thank all of the liturgists. I want to thank Victor today for the special music and the deacons and all the musicians, Jamie and other, others who have brought us beautiful music through the summer Sundays. Thanks as well to all of you for your constant and faithful presence in our family of faith. Today, we begin a six-part sermon series entitled The New Social Gospel. All our sermons will be delivered from this pulpit, which is the pulpit of First Congregational Church when we first opened at 74 East Broad Street in the year 1856. Remember, in 1852, we had become an abolitionist church, the first white congregation of abolitionists in the city of Columbus. And this pulpit was the first in the new building. It was the pulpit for 75 years. We often call it the Gladden pulpit because 36 of those years, Dr. Washington Gladden preached from this pulpit. But remember, there were a lot of other years when faithful women and men preached as well from this. But it is important to always remember that this is not only the pulpit of the old church, the old building, but it is ours. And so we bring it out of the chapel today and celebrate its presence as we come to this time. Thanks be to God for all the women and men who have brought forth God's holy word from this pulpit across 167 years and who have led worship and the praise of God in our 171 years together. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. In 1912, Ohio held a constitutional convention and made adaptations to our state's constitution. President Theodore Roosevelt came to Columbus for this, and he said in a letter he said to his friend Washington Gladden, I want to stay with you. I want to stay as far away from the State House as possible. Politicians drive me crazy. Which was kind of an interesting thing to be saying when you were the former president of the United States. So there he was on East Town Street with Dr. Gladden. He was there to speak at the convention. And, and the convention, as you may remember or may have heard, was made for changing what we had had in the Constitution to something new. But President Roosevelt was there specifically to speak to what was called the initiative, led by progressive Republicans who convinced re progressive Democrats and progressive independents to join the cause. I love the trajectory of that. Progressive Republicans got the others to come along. The initiative was passed and became the law of our land in Ohio. Under this constitutional mandate, ordinary citizens could bring and could fight for control of moneyed interests and those who used their power as elected officials to do things that the citizens didn't want. For 111 years, Ohioans have had this power and used these rights judiciously. In fact, only 19 of the 71 initiatives that have been brought through the initiatives in these past 1,111 uh, years have gone through. That makes a 26% passage of the initiatives. My friend, Mike Curtin, like me, a devoted lover of baseball, pointed out that since 1912, there have been 20 perfect games pitched in baseball in tens of thousands of games played. A perfect game, as you know, is one where no one gets a hit, no one gets on base, 27 up, 27 out. It is considered to be like a blue moon event. And voters approving a citizen initi initiated amendment is even rarer than that. This past week, I read through all 50 pages of the changes brought by the ballot box of citizens in Ohio 
over the past 111 years. I also read those that were brought to the general, brought by the General Assembly before all the voters of Ohio. I read each and every one of them. Of the 71 brought for our vote by fellow citizens, among the 19 perfect game resolutions that passed, these were some of the things that went through, most of the things that went through. First, in 1933, there was support added for our aged citizens to protect them as they were aging during the heart of the Depression. In 1936, the excise tax on items purchased in stores was abolished. In 1947, money was prohibited to be used from taxes on cars and gasoline for anything but highways and infrastructure. And it's remained that way ever since. And then, in, it, uh, there was an establishment in 1977, you see the gap between the 30 years, for 30 days registration before you could vote in the state of Ohio, no matter when it was or what election you were a part of. Also passed in 1992 were three decisions. We passed three in one year. They were decisions that said we would put limits on elected officials serving in the U.S. Senate, which had been limited to two terms and was extended to four terms, right? So the extension of limits, actually. But all the other elected officers in the state of Ohio had terms limits shut down, basically. Huh, wonder how that happened. And then there was the prohibition of wholesale taxes on soft drinks and non-alcoholic drinks in 1994. You may remember that one. And then in 2004, it was declared that marriage was only between a man and a woman. One of our least big news events. It was overturned by the Supreme Court in 2015, in case you didn't know. Although there's still a billboard on 71 coming south that says marriage is only between a man and a woman. If you don't believe me, just drive north and come back. So, there's also the increase of the minimum wage that happened in 2006. The abolishment of smoking in public places happened in 2006. The establishment of casinos in four cities happened in 2009 after having failed three previous times. And then there was also the protection of workers' rights to organize and have union representation in 2011, protected health care for all Ohioans in 2011, the special anti spe special interest amendment that said in the Constitution you could not buy your way into this state in 2015. It was a monumental moment. One, by the way, that those who are proposing the current change keep saying that special interests will buy you out. You can't do that in the state of Ohio. It's against the law because you passed it. We passed it. So anyway, in 17, victims' rights was passed. Crime victims' rights were established. And of course, the one I saved for last, my favorite of all, happened way back when, in 1949, when we permitted the manufacture and sale of oleomargarine. It's in the Constitution, just like that. So if you're wondering, and you're going to the State Fair this year, you might want to check to see the sculptures that are supposedly made out of butter. They might be made out of oleo margarine instead. I just don't know. That might be. Anyway, right now, conservative Republicans in our General Assembly, hand in hand with fundamentalist Christians of both Protestant and Catholic backgrounds, want to change the initiative, want to change our law, want to take away from us, in a sense, citizens' rights. That's exactly what will happen on August 8th if we stand by and do nothing or if we vote yes. And that's why I want you to think about and I'm encouraging you to vote no if you haven't already. I'll get back to this. All of this will change on August 8th with a yes vote. Against the better judgment of two former Republican governors, two former Democratic governors, every other Secretary of State who has ever served in this state, and just about all of the electorate at 58 percent who oppose this, the General Assembly wants us to support 
the requirement that every ballot initiative must have 60% of voters to pass a new constitutional amendment instead of a simple majority of 50% plus one. It would also require us to do the following. All citizens who want to place an amendment on the ballot to collect signatures, they have to do it from at least 5% of the voters in each of the 88 counties and those numbers will be based on the last gubernatorial election, right? And there is no, they will eliminate the 10-day cure period, which has always allowed citizens to replace any signatures that were deemed faulty by the Secretary of State's office. In other words, when you hand it in, it's over. That's all changed. You don't get a second chance with this. One of my friends put it this way. If issue one were a football game, it would mean that even though Ohio State outscored Michigan 59 to 41, Michigan would win. Think about that. 40% determines the outcome of elections. That's really what this says. Now that's wrong unless you're a big Michigan fan. In addition, by all these standards, none of the initiatives except one that has been brought forth in the last 111 years would have met these three thresholds. Not one, except the oleomargarine one. That's right, that's the only one that would have met all three thresholds because it was popular in all 88 counties. In other words, we would have at the end of this no citizens' actions ever in Ohio. None of them ever would have passed except the one. I know what you're thinking. What would Ohio have been like without oleomargarine? I know that's on your mind. Or what would we have been like without care for the elderly? Or the increase in minimum wage? Or banning smoking in public places? Not even this General Assembly is free to do this to us. I think we have to face this down. Also, I think we need to remember that if they get this through, they can do anything. It's open season. Anything can go if this goes. I'm sorry, but that's a sign that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Why is this so important that after this General Assembly declared that we should never again hold a special statewide election in the summertime, that we all of the sudden have to do it in August of 2023. Why? Why is this so important that we do it now? And what it will mean, and if you haven't voted and you're gonna go on August 8th, make sure to, if your voting place is open, because 24 of the places are closed in Franklin County because there's not enough people to work them. Anyway, so why is it so important to be doing this in the summertime when they said they would never do it again? Well, it's simply stated by Frank LaRose as this. This ballot initiative is an election that is about one thing and one thing only. It's about abortion, which is really strange because abortion is nowhere mentioned in this ballot initiative we have been forced to vote in the middle of the summer because Mr. LaRose and his cronies set for us the fear factor of having an initiative in November that would protect women's productive rights in the state of Ohio and turn back some of the very oppressive laws that have been established by this legislature around abortion. It's scary. By the way, polling has shown that 59% of Ohioans and over a three quarter of a million signatures have come in. Many of you have signed the petitions to put this on the ballot in November. And all of these things have come in and all of a the sudden they're not gonna happen if this passes, okay? They will be struck down by this deceptive, deceitful, devious, and undemocratic initiative before us now. From this pulpit in 1912, 
doc, from this pulpit, I don't mean from theoretical pulpits, from this pulpit in 1912. Dr. Gladden led the charge for the Constitutional Initiative. He was one of the co-chairs for Franklin County's proposed changes to the Constitution. There were 42 changes that they brought forth to the state Constitution during the Constitutional Convention that year. Of the 42 that came out of Franklin County, 40 were accepted and put into our Constitution. The only two that failed were the establishments of women's rights to vote, again, bashing women in elected ways, and the end of the death penalty, or the end of capital punishment in Ohio. And I think back, had that passed, had Gladden's initiatives gone through, we would have been the forerunner for the states in this country, rather than, once again, at the back of the pack. We would have led change, which we could have done. Those were the only two that failed. But there were many positive changes that came from that Constitution, including the initiative. See, I believe our democracy is in crisis. We are faced with what I call a demo crisis. Too many politicians have sold out their votes and their values to the highest bidder. Too many voters have given up in despair about the state of affairs in politics. The fewer the voters and votes, the worse the crisis becomes. It feeds on itself. The cynical politicians in the State House are counting on very few people showing up right now in the heat of the summer and in the heart of the summer to vote on or before August 8th. But so far, they're off the mark because tens of thousands of us are showing up to vote early. They were not anticipating that. If only a few show up, of course, anti-democratic, and I would call them anti-American initiatives, will pass and forever doom the future of initiatives in this state, ever coming from citizens. I really worry for my children and my grandchildren living in the state of Ohio. My son the other day told me, I won't return to Ohio if this goes through. I can't live there if this happens. So, there you have it. Maybe that's not true in your household, but it's true in mine. So we have to some way find a way through. In February 1912, the former president, Theodore Roosevelt, spoke at the Ohio State House about this initiative. He began by channeling Abraham Lincoln who 53 years earlier made his first visit to the State House on September 16, 1859, where he reprised his famous, a house divided cannot stand remarks against slavery, which by the way, at that point was about a thousand feet from the front doors of First Church. That's where we were located. Roosevelt said, with Lincoln, I hold that this country with its institutions belongs to the people who inhabit it. Whenever they shall grow weary of the existing government, they can exercise their constitutional right of amending it. He continued, you are engaged in the fundamental work of self-government, framing a constitution to allow the people to do justice and absolutely to rule themselves. Roosevelt warned of the false constitutionalism of conservatives beholden to moneyed interests. He said the true progressive, the progressive of the Lincoln stamp, is the only true constitutionalist, is the only real conservative. We are engaged in one of the great battles of the age-long context waged against privilege on behalf of the common welfare. This country, as Lincoln said, belongs to all the people. Lincoln, who was a keen student of history himself, knew of Alexander Hamilton's warning in the Federalist, Federalist Papers 22, which required supermajority votes. Hamilton wrote, what at first sight may be a remedy is really a poison. He continued, empowering minority rule increases the likelihood of bribery and corruption. Now, our supposed leaders in the State House allowed and a number of them participated in the largest bribery scandal in the history of Ohio. 
and they allowed the people who did it to remain in office on our watch and theirs. They are not to be trusted in my mind. Many of them are either independently wealthy or are bankrolled to big money interests which are purposely intending to dilute grassroots power. Our voting no at the ballot either on or before August 8th is one way to stop these interests. Vote no so that democracy has a chance. Join with the two former Republican governors, whose names I saw, by the way, on buildings at the State Fair, which was great, and the two former Democratic governors, and a host of others who love democracy in Ohio and want to see an end to this madness. Let's join with millions of other Ohioans to keep in place the ballot initiative we have, which is 50% plus one vote. It should stay that way. Now, before I sit down, I need to address something that I'm sure is on some of your minds, maybe all of your minds. Why is he talking about politics from the pulpit? Well, one defensible answer is because it's this pulpit. <laughs> okay, this is the pulpit. This is the pulpit, if you call it the bully pulpit, right, as Roosevelt would. This is the pulpit that dealt with these issues in this state forever. If I can't do it here, I can't do it anywhere. But that's not a great answer. It would be nice if we lived in a world which could easily and comfortably be compartmentalized into faith and life, into politics and spirituality. But we have never lived in such a world, never. And we never will. Realists know that. Our challenge is rather to find the balance that we need to thrive in the world in which we do live. Sometimes that means standing up and speaking out and acting when something is wrong and when you have tried to fix it any other way. Maybe this is it, at least for a preacher, right? And in my heart, everything about the process and the content of this ballot initiative is wrong. It's wrong. You may disagree with me, and I'd love to have that conversation with you over coffee or anything else after August 8th, because I'm going to be working <laughs> as hard as I can till then. I look forward to those conversations. But in the meantime, we all need to step up and say and express whether it's yes or no, why it's important to us to change the initiative process in Ohio. Sitting on the sidelines, doing absolutely nothing is not the answer now, and it never will be. In that way, democracy must not be mocked. In this series on the new social gospel, I will point out that Jesus was not just about talking about the world or praying about the world in which we live in the parables and in the stories and in his healings. We tend to spiritualize the parables by referring to the kingdom of heaven the actual translation from the Aramaic is the empire of heaven. Jesus was juxtaposing the Roman empire with God's empire in heaven. And he points out that dull hearts and dull minds can get sucked into an empire on earth. And God is trying to establish just and equitable empires, heavenly empires, as the Lord's prayer says, and we'll all say in just a few minutes on earth as in heaven. Our God is not so heavenly minded that our God is no earthly good, nor does God want us to be either. We have to plant our small seeds of hope. We have to watch them grow. Please note that Jesus links the empire of God to a woman who is at work in her kitchen, and he does more. Jesus genuinely is concerned that the supposed leaders of the people are completely out of touch with the people of his times and therefore out of touch with God. Jesus wants the folks who are soaking in the parables to be reflections of God's reign on earth as in heaven. Each of the parables points to new ways of establishing such hope. So I look forward to the weeks ahead as we journey through the parables and the stories and into the new social gospel. Thanks be to God. Amen.